Welcome to Construct Tech TV, and I'm Peggy Smedley. The residential construction market has experienced its share of both ups and downs, and now it seems the market is beginning to stabilize a bit, with growth predicted in the future, but we are still seeing builder confidence numbers stall. Now let's take a closer look. According to the recent numbers from the U.S. Census Bureau and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development show that privately owned housing units authorized by building permits in August were 5.7 below percent, I should actually say, below the July rate. Now, housing starts in August were 9.2 percent above the July rate, and housing completions in August were 2.5 percent above July numbers. So we see all of the summer numbers are showing some mixed results. At the same time, predictions for the future even show stronger spending is on the horizon. Now the FMI U.S. Construction Outlook reveals spending is led by three key segments. Coming in at number one is transportation. A 10% spending growth is predicted. No surprise there. Coming in at number two with 9% are residential improvements. And in third, but also tied for second, is office. But let's be honest here. The economy is in good shape, and we're seeing low unemployment rates, wage improvements, and buyers are showing an increasing willingness to pay. This will all lead to a stronger residential market in the future. So why then is confidence still struggling overall? First, let's look at the numbers again. Numbers are so very important. Confidence in the multifamily housing market edged down in the second quarter of 2018, dipping just two points. The score is on a scale of zero to 100. Now the number above 50 indicates more respondents report conditions are improving. Right now, we are sitting at about 51. So why then, if forecasts are high, is confidence running low? Since the downturn of 2009, the residential market has never truly recovered. We are talking almost a decade ago. Many markets dried up and builders left the building business entirely. Now demand is beginning to pick up and the builders that remain are having difficulty getting new projects off the ground. Despite the new surge that is heating up, builders need to get creative about how they are building new projects and if they want to keep up. Now let's look at two essential ways. The first big change is manufactured housing. The trend is certainly not new. Between 1908 and 1940, Sears, Roebuck, and Company sold roughly 75,000, 74,000 homes through a mail order program. Who knows what the future looks like, but let's forget about that for the moment. The benefit here was the ability to mass produce the materials used in the homes. This lessened manufacturing costs and it lowered purchase costs for customers. Today's manufactured homes are built to a federal building code, and they can provide good quality at a lower cost today. Advances in technology are allowing construction companies to provide more detail than ever before. And the trend of a prefab is seeing new momentum across the entire construction industry. So the first area I would suggest keeping an eye on for the future is prefab manufacturing, and I think it's going to continue to grow. The second growth is artificial intelligence and machine learning, both in the construction industry and in the home in general. AI in the home is becoming connected faster than ever before. IDC, in fact, predicts the smart home devices market will grow by 18.5% through 2022. Now, Gartner even says one in five workers engaged in mostly non-routine tasks will rely on AI to do a job by 2022. Everybody loves that 2022 year. That certainly applies to construction. Now, that prediction is less than five years away. Just think about that. But I am honestly not sure 
if the residential construction market is ready to adopt all these new emergent technologies just yet. But let's think about that. We are still struggling to find the skilled labor. We talk so much about that. Many companies are still trying to get a handle on such things as ERP, enterprise resource planning, and integrating all of their information technology tools. I know these are new and emerging technologies, and we're talking about what's coming next, and they are all coming together, and they are all what the construction industry needs, but we need to be looking at other things like con what construction will have to do and most likely I say the construction industry, industry in general is going to have to walk before it can run. I think one area though AI can help with is home inventory. Imagine being able to share a digital home inventory with service providers in mortgage, finance, insurance and the homeowner. Just think about that. AI can also track collected data, look for patterns, and give predictive project adjustments based on historical information. That's pretty cool stuff, right? This technology is coming, and you need to be ready for it. Now, this just might be the time for all of us to talk about how to get there. The residential construction market has been changing quite a bit lately, and we have been seeing a lot more investment in the space, and there has been an uptick in M&A activity among the technology companies. As one example, in March 2017, ECI Software Solutions acquired Mark Systems. To talk all about the changes in the residential market, I'm being joined by Scott Duman, president of Residential Construction Group Building and Construction Division of ECI Software Solutions. Scott, welcome to the show. Hi, Peggy, how are you? Great. Are you seeing a lot of opportunity in construction right now on the residential side of things? Uh, yeah, so we deal with builders that are building between 25 and about 2,000 homes a year, and we're seeing a lot of strong growth. Um, you know, since the recession, things have been picking up. Um, we had uh, projections. Uh, we track the number of starts that our builders um, build uh, monthly, and um, eight out of nine months so far this year, we've exceeded our projections. We're way up uh, over our projections for the whole year. So. Um, we're seeing a lot of activity, a lot of growth uh, with the builders that we work with. In looking at that, though, is that because when we look at the numbers right now, and I was it was looking at numbers earlier today, and they're all over the place, you know, where right. numbers are showing growth, sh you know, where we see what projections are. are. Is that because, you know, builders are still unsure because a lot of builders left the market? Is it basically because you know they can't figure out where things are? It's still kind of an iffy market, or is it still because I don't know? Well, what are you saying? I mean, you know, when you look at everything, because I don't know that we see really steady numbers that represent the market is going to go one way or the other right now. Yeah, I mean, everything that I see from economists show that uh, things you know s slowly trending upward, probably for the next two years or so. Um, Again, we see strong growth from the builders that we work with. I think when you get outside of the um, the large public builders, I just saw an article this morning that said that the percentage of new homes being built by the large public builders actually declined, which means there's a bigger share for the the smaller builders. So the you know the smaller uh, regional and local builders, um, you know, they understand their marketplaces sometimes better than the the, the big players do. Um, they can uh, make changes and it can rack faster. Uh, one of the things that you probably have seen a lot of uh, articles about is that um, there's a lot of houses that were in the market on the upper end, and there wasn't a lot of uh, entry level or affordable homes coming in the marketplace. And so, you know, it takes time uh, to get land on uh, the market to be able to build more affordable homes. And I think that you're starting to see some of that. I've also seen some uh, articles recently about um, kind of a slowdown in uh, starts that. Um, you know, there's uh, the number of homes that are permitted uh, are up over last year, uh, but there's might be a little bit of a slowdown in new starts because of the way um, uh, costs have gone up, uh, material costs and steel and lumber and things like that, and uh, that some builders might just be delaying and, and waiting for 
Um, some of that has slowed down. I've recently seen some articles saying that um, you know this fall uh, some of those trends are going to slow down or maybe in reverse. You know, we just have the the new um, Mexico uh, Canada. Um, the, the whole agreement that we just so had, President just Trump just, so, yeah. Right, so who knows what's going to happen with that because, you know, uh, bills were dealing with, with, with lumber prices going up and steel prices going up. So, you know, uh, this, could, this could change things. So looking at all that, when we, we put all these things together, I mean, does it give builders confidence or do they still say, look, we don't know, we're going to get into the market, we're going to start doing things or... Do they, you know, is it you say the next two years from a tech perspective, how do they then make investments? Because, you know, you look at where, you know, they don't know what lumber is going to be. They don't know what steel is going to be. They don't know the things that they're going to have to invest in, you know, where their supplies, materials, supplies, things like that. Then they have to say, look, I've got to be more efficient. How do right. they kind of look at these things and say, do they not start looking at it and say, look, I've got to start looking at technology. Now's a good time to make a technology investment. How do they really start looking at what they need to be doing? And then the labor situation. I mean, you know, it's hard to get the right craftspeople to help do these things. How does a builder kind of put all these puzzle pieces together to know what they need to do right now in a market that's still a little bit volatile in some ways? Yeah, sure. So, you know, Costs, you know, recently with with lumber and steel and and other building materials have gone up, but th that's not nothing different than builders have dealt with for years. I mean, uh, a long time ago, not a long time ago, but you know, five or six years ago, it was gypsum prices. So, the, the, I so mean, it's always, always the life of being prices. a builder. Yeah, it's, it's part of being a builder, and the same thing with um, with labor costs. You know, um, it's a tight labor market right now. You, we lost a lot of people in this industry. During the recession, they went and found other jobs. They haven't come back. A lot of people are aging out of it. Um, so I think, uh, you know, if you're a smart builder, you're not looking uh, two years down the road say, well, things are just going to slow down, so I shouldn't invest. Um, I think it's important for builders to be looking at where they are right now and investing so that they're prepared if there is a, a downturn, that that they're ready for it. Um, because it'll be the, you know, the, the more... Um, Tech savvy, the efficient, profitable builders. Now they're able to withstand any kind of downturn in the market. And looking at that right now, are there things that they should be looking at from things like looking? We talk about prefab now. We talk about these, you know, 3D. We're talking about certain things. Are those the kind of things too that they should start consider? You know, as technology is moving, that might be the way that they start seeing the way of the future in in homes and things like that as well. I think they should be definitely looking at those types of things. Uh, we still see plenty of builders that are big builders, maybe building 100 homes a year, that are using spreadsheets and QuickBooks, and it's just surprising. Mind-boggling, right? It's, it is mind-boggling. Um, you know, so there's there's a whole range of things depending on the builder. Um, and how much they've embraced technology in the past. Uh, a lot of a lot of smaller builders have not. And you know, if you want to compete against the big public builders, who are using all kinds of technology, you know, you've got to you got to embrace it. And um, so, for a lot of the people that we deal with, it just starts off with a, an ERP system. And some of the things like you talked about um, with a 3D, you know, for sales. Um, you know, there's but there's a whole range of things they should be looking at. So what advice, I guess, you know, as we wrap up here, would you give home builders today? Looking at, you said, you know, you, you gave a little advice here about what they have to do. Is there something or some steps you would tell them, whether they're large or small, that you would, you would give them at this point? Well, I think that what they ought to do is look at um, technology as an investment and not as an expense. A lot of the smaller builders just think Number it's an one. expense. Number one, right. Right. Look at a monthly payment and, you know, I, and aren't really looking at the, the long-term impact of what it can mean to their business. So I think that they got to treat it as an investment. Uh, number one, they should look for something that's totally integrated. Um, you know, there are a lot of different systems out there that you could use for, for sales and, and accounting and customer service and scheduling. They're all uh, separate systems. If they had something that's integrated so they can become more efficient, enter data one time, let it throw, flow throughout the system, you know, that's an important factor. Um, to, to make sure that um, the systems talk to each other. 
Um, and I think it's important to have uh, somebody that has been in this business for a long time, like we have, that specialize in this industry. We have consultants on our team that have built homes, that have uh, managed homes, that uh, managed companies that built uh, five, 600 homes a year, have been the CFOs of companies that uh, have built uh, uh, hundreds of homes. So it's important that you work with a company that understands what it is uh, to be a home builder. And that's the kind of people that we have working for us. And times are changing, and I think it's important that the industry kind of works together and kind of, you know, whether you're a builder, a tech company, you know, it's times that you, everybody's got to work together and see the future, right? Because the industry is constantly changing, right? Exactly. And, you know, one thing I forgot to mention, but it, it kind of goes with what you're saying is it's important for the builders to work closely with their trade partners. So, you know, we have a system that allows them all to communicate together so they're on the same page. Um, and one of the things we have to do is, make sure that we're taking care of the, the trades to, to make it easier for them. So not only is the builder more efficient, but their trade partners are more efficient. Um, so they want to, want to do work with builders because we got to do things that are going to draw people into this industry and, and you know, not have them want to go find jobs um, in, in other industries. That's a great point. Scott Duman, President, Residential Construction Group, Building and Construction Division of ECI Software. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Peggy. All right, thank you. All right, we're out of time, right, for today. Thank you. Every 90 seconds, firefighters across the United States respond to a reported house fire. Residential fires are often preventable, yet they are one of the biggest threats to safety. A new report from Secure Life identifies the states with the most and fewest house fire fatalities in 2018. I want to talk about that here on today's show. Hopefully, this gives you insights into how to build a safer home. Today, I am joined by Sage Singleton, the Community Outreach Manager for A Secure Life. Sage, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So Sage, let's talk about what are the primary causes for house fires right now. Sure, so the four main causes of house fires are smoking, cooking, heating, and electrical accidents. And most of these are preventable, but they're the leading causes of fatal house fires in the U.S. So how do we help prevent those? I mean, because we talk about what builders and residents can do, but how can we actually prevent these? Sure. So I'll start with the first cause. So with smoking, if you're going to smoke, take it outside, if at all possible. Uh, your chances yeah, of good luck with that, right? Fire Right, having telling people to take their smoking outside, right? Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> but if they do smoke inside, make sure that you're awake and you're not smoking before a situation where you could fall asleep. Make sure you have an ashtray that's deep and where the sparks can't get loose and set a couch or a bedspread or a rug on fire. But my number one safety tip would be to take it outside if possible when let me, smoking. Let me ask you that about smoking inside. I would assume a lot of people do smoke in bed or in couches. There's got to be a lot of that, right? I mean, that's got to be a, a big no-no for a lot of people. Yeah, so this year there's been 60 fatal house fires caused by smoking indoors. And, and is that something right now that is it getting better or worse when we talk about that? The numbers are pretty consistent year over year. There hasn't been a sharp increase or decrease in uh, fatal house fires by smoking. It seems to be consistently a problem, yet it is preventable. People just need to be more alert and cautious and realize that when they smoke, they have the potential to set their home on fire. So go on to your second one. Sure. So the other, the next leading cause of fatal house fires is cooking. And so the safety tip I have is to keep an eye on your stove when you're cooking. Don't leave the oven or the stove. Don't leave your home to run an errand and assume everything will be fine. Watch house fires caused by cooking are in, in, incredibly dangerous. There's been 49 fatal house fires um, caused by cooking this year. And especially these numbers increase around the holidays. So with Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas coming up in the next 90 days, it's essential for people to take cooking seriously and realize that it is a leading cause of fatal house fires in the U.S. A lot of people try to do pretty stupid things with turkeys, right? They're kind of, kind of yes. cooking if those turkeys. Yes, if you're going to deep fry a turkey, 
make sure you know what you're doing and keep a fire extinguisher in the house near your cooking, near your kitchen in case something goes awry. Okay. And number three? Number three is heating. So things like having an open flame from a fireplace, space heaters, um, your heating and conditioning system, air conditioning system, those are a little bit less at fault. Space heaters, people need to be careful to turn them off when you're going to bed. Or if you do have them throughout the evening, make sure it's not near a blanket or a rug and it's standing independent so it can't cause a fire. If you have an open flame fireplace, make sure you properly extinguish that before you go to bed. Um, and when it comes to the heating system, make sure that you're having it regularly maintenanced. And if you're a home builder, make sure you remind your the homeowners to, it may be new to start with, but check the wiring, check the electrical system by a professional electrician and make sure everything's up to code to prevent uh, errors and malfunctions causing a fatal house fire. And then finally? And then the last is electrical. So that is similar to heating in the sense that you need to watch your electrical cords. Make sure you're not over um, overpowering the electrical socket. Install surge protectors. Uh, if your wires are frayed, replace those. And just be really on top of your home maintenance. Notice things like this, take them seriously. And if you see an electrical cord that's frayed, replace it, call an electrician, so you can prevent house fires. We see a lot of things with at the holidays, when people are plugging in too many things, lights in the holidays, a lot of those kind of fires at that time. Yes, Christmas lights. If you're plugging those into the outlet, make sure it's not overloaded. Make sure you're unplugging it when you leave the house. And another common cause is the laundry machine, the washer and dryer. Um, those can spark easily. So make sure that you're routinely checking the cords behind your refrigerator, your laundry machine. Um, if you're not sure what to look for, call a professional. That's something worth spending the money on as it could save your life. Let's talk about this. What kind of tips can builders give and measures that they can take to help right now when building a home or remodeling a home, when they're talking with folks that they're doing right now and some of these things? Sure. So while house fires are preventable to some measure, there's some things you can do as a precaution. So home builders, they can be working with a homeowner to make sure that they're installing the proper materials. So for example, roofs. If the roof is made out of certain materials compared to like a wood, a wooden shingles or things like that, um, home builders can be aware of precautions they can take. So put on a fireproofing um, coat on the roof or put wire mesh over the vents. There's little things in the building process that can prevent house fires or at least um, increase safety. Also things like double paned glass on windows. Those are more fire resistant. And so if home builders are educated about what materials they can be using and then take what they know and teach the homeowners because a lot of homeowners don't know what materials are safer or more dangerous. And so if home builders can help educate homeowners, that can help decrease fatal house fires. So if builders take a more aggressive role in some of these things, we can actually prevent some of these house fires. I mean, because that's really something that builders can really step up and do some things with. Absolutely, yes. And another thing that home builders can do is they can coordinate with other third parties. So for example, the interior designer or the contractors or the electrician, if the home builders are talking to them and they're all in conversation about layout. So for example, if you have, like I was talking about with fireplaces, if the layout of the fireplace is going to it looks dangerous or there could be some potential accidents. Having a conversation between all parties involved in the home building process can increase education and awareness, which can result in decreased house fires. So we started this out, this conversation out, thinking about the basic things that cause a fire, but are there some states that actually do, do, do things better than other states that have more uh, precautions or have less fatalities than other states? Because it sounds like, you know, this is a great opportunity for, you know, municipalities and states and builders to work together to keep communities safer if they do the right things. Sure. Yeah. So some of the leading, the most dangerous states this year for house fires are 
Texas, New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and California. So basically, Those they're not doing the right things. Those states are doing the poorly in what they could be doing. They're not doing the best things. Yes, they have the most fatal house fires just in 2018. Compared to the states that have had the least fatal house fires, those states are North Dakota, Wyoming, South Dakota, Hawaii, and New Mexico. But why? why? And where fires are dangerous. But why? What, what are they doing? I mean, what are those states doing better than the other states? I mean, it's great to be on a list saying one state's doing better than the other, but what are they actually doing that makes one state, a group of states, better than another? Sure. I think what it comes down to is if you look back to the causes of house fires, smoking, cooking, heating, and electrical issues, the states that are the best or have the least fatal house fires are just paying more attention to those. Obviously, fires can occur in any state, but the states that are the safest in 2018 are just taking more precautionary measures to prevent these preventable causes of house fires. And does that mean they're getting their designers and builders actively involved in the community so that they're all aware of what they need to do to take those active measures? I would say the correlation is strong on that. Um, obviously, like I said, house fires can occur anywhere, but what the research shows is that these states are working together as a community with their fire municipalities, with their home builders, with their HOAs to do what they reasonably can to decrease house fires. Sage Singleton, the community outreach manager for uh, Secure Life, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Have a nice day. As I mentioned, the forecast for the residential construction market is positive, but the builder confidence is still low. So let's explore the state of the residential construction market just a little bit further. So for this discussion today, I am joined by construction industry veteran and a dear friend, Jim Cassane. Jim, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. It's great to see you as well. Peggy, it's always a pleasure to be on your program. So, Jim, let's talk about the state of the residential market. What's your take on it right now? Well, generally, from my point of view, I think it's generally healthy. I think there's a lot of new activity, but there's also a significant amount of activity, I'm saying, in the areas of the country that have been hit by natural disasters. So there's a lot of replacement and renovation work going on. So do you think it's the natural disasters that have been boosting the work that's being done? Or do you think some of this residential work would have actually occurred despite what's been happening on the natural disaster side? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, but I would say that even without the natural disasters, there would be a goodly amount of activity in the sector. Well, looking at it right now, do you think we're going to continue to see some bump in residential construction work in the months ahead versus what we've been seeing up to this point? Well, I think there's a good possibility of that. For example, the people that are selling properties right now are benefiting from the windfall of very, very high resale values. And so as they sell and they get into new housing, it's going to drive that. And on the other end of the spectrum, those that are first getting into the housing space, are we're seeing a good amount of activity in terms of multifamily development. Looking at what's actually been happening in the past, but what's actually going to be looking from what's now going forward, what do you think about this? You know, residential construction market, is it actually booming? You think it's going to continue? We've seen a lot of changes. What's your take on what's been going on then? Well, we have seen a lot of changes, and I think to a certain extent, a lot of it depends on uh, what happens with the Fed and interest rates and things of that nature. But by the same token, uh, we have a cycle where people are looking at moving into different properties, you know, upsizing, downsizing, uh, right sizing. You know, there's a lot of that activity, which tends to occur, according to my real estate friends, about every six to seven years. 
So is that because, I mean, we talk about this a lot, that residential sees a lot of ups and downs. And you and I have been in this market a long time. We've seen a lot of things happen. And the residential builders really r ride that wave. Are we in a good wave right now, an upturn? And that's just right now we're lucky. I mean, the president's been talking about we're seeing a, a boon right now. Is that what we're experiencing? And we can continue to uh, hope to expect that to continue? Well, I think anybody that takes a look at their personal portfolio would agree that the market is doing well and that there's a sense of optimism related to that. But that has to be balanced against what builders are saying in terms of impact by things like the tariffs and the effect that that's having as well as the reality of the skilled labor shortage. So then let's talk about that. What are some of the challenges builders are going to have to face? I mean, right now, tariffs seem to be okay. We seem to be kind of avoiding that bump right now, or it's on hold, maybe. But are there some other things that we really kind of have to be concerned about as builders? Well, I wouldn't discount the impact of the tariffs. Right now, if you're buying steel for anything or aluminum for anything, uh, the builders that do their pre-buy at the beginning of the project are the ones that are mitigating as much of the damage associated with the tariff impacts. But the ones that are waiting until they get to a particular stage to order their materials, I think they're in for some surprises. On the other hand, the skilled labor shortage is something that's being felt across all sectors and all industries, particularly with respect to the people I talk to in the construction domain. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about electrical, mechanical, plumbing, tile, concrete, roofing, uh, that is an issue that's dogging all of the contractors out there right now. So when we talk about tariffs, we're talking about less than maybe 1% of a job, right, in general, that affects them. When you talk about overall material costs and things like that. But when you talk about the labor, we're talking about a big part of that. I mean, that's a big issue. Are we talking that the labor problem could actually sh slow down residential construction? Is that what you're saying right now? That's what we're going to continue, and that could really hurt new residential construction, maybe even harder than, let's say, commercial construction? Oh, absolutely, Peggy. The, com the combination of the skilled labor shortage and the clamp down on immigration restrictions and people that typically work as framers, as roofers, as laborers, uh, you're already feeling the pinch in many, many different markets. But the skilled labor shortage goes beyond that. It's not only the number of people we have available in the market right now, but it's also the skill levels. As you know, that Home Depot and the Home Builders Institute uh, put together a new apprenticeship program recently, and their goal was to take people who were former military and to move them into the construction space. But the things that they're trying to bring them into are things that we have taken for granted for a long time, and that is basic product identification, knowing what things are called and how they're used, and basic construction mathematics, uh, distances, angles, and things of that nature that are essential no matter which of the trades you're in. So interesting part of this, do you think technology itself is going to make a big difference in this? Because that's really where I think we're headed. I think technology can really improve. I think we're going to have to have the trades no matter what. But I think we're going to have a time where technology is going to come in and where we're going to be able to change certain jobs, but we're going to have a gap. Is that what we're talking about here? It, very much so. And uh, for contractors, I think one of the things that we need to wrap our heads around is the increased use. Larger firms are doing this already, but smaller firms need to be doing it as well. There's so many applicants that are out there for any job in construction these days that they need to make better use of applicant tracking systems that are able to call from the applications that they're receiving, the people that not only have the skill sets, but also the experiences that are necessary to do the job. And the experience levels, as you indicated, technology is changing the nature of the workforce. And there are so many different aspects that are being used on the job site today that are different than what you had 10 years ago 
and applicants need to be able to literally wrap their heads around the use of these technologies because doing business in the residential market the way you did 10 years ago just isn't practical or profitable today. So what do you think, Jim? You've been around. You've had many different positions in the construction space. You've kind of retired now. You've been doing some, involved in some church buildings and things like that. Are we seeing a different kind of construction worker? Is that what we really have to think about? The way we motivate, the way we get construction workers in has to be different. Is that what we've got to think about in residential? Is that we've got to kind of combine construction and we're not understanding about what needs to be done. The construction sites of today are different than what they were 10 years ago, five years ago, what they're going to be in five years from now. Very much so. And it's not just the tradespeople that we have to be looking at. We also have to be looking at middle and upper management. As we know, the people that are in middle and upper management in construction today are moving toward retirement in the next few years. And we have to be able to transition not only their tacit knowledge, their experience, their understandings, their contacts, the things that make it easy to go from job site to job site and to be able to apply what's been learned before, uh, then it's to get institutionalized. Otherwise, there's going to be a steep learning curve as we move into new projects and new technologies. Well, Jim, I love having you on the show. I hope you'll come back and talk to us again. I would be pleasured to do that. Thank you very much, Peggy. All right. Thank you, Jim. We really appreciate it. You take care. You have a good day. Bye-bye. My final thoughts for today are related to the construction industry as a whole, and specifically residential construction. From the wildfires in the West to the hurricanes in the South, sadly, we have been seeing an uptick in natural disasters. Quite frankly, we have also seen a rise in man-made disasters, with a number of infrastructure failures occurring across the globe. How much have we talked about this? But perhaps that's a different discussion for a different time. But now, as towns are being decimated by disasters, we need to rebuild. We need to create homes that are sustainable and sturdy for all of the occupants. But who's going to do this? You are, as builders. And as builders, you must be prepared for these disasters. So my acronym for today is DR, Disaster Recovery. Now here's a scary fact. One in four businesses is forced to close permanently because of a disaster. Companies need to put a plan in place to help a business recover quickly. This includes strategies for emergency situations. It also includes backing up and protecting what? All of your data. Why is this so important? Because your businesses can close if it's not prepared. That's right, they'll close. But I think there are other key reasons to be ready. And here are my top three. First, machines fail. Plain and simple, they fail. You need to be prepared. Second, customers have come to expect constant uptime. They want things when they want them. And lastly, a good DR strategy can help rebuild towns that are where they are hit when the disaster comes. Being able to access information means your company can get back to work quickly. With man-made disasters hitting 10% of small businesses and 30% being impacted by a natural disaster, it's time your company put a plan in place. Time to do a disaster recovery plan, plain and simple, today. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And thanks for watching Construct Tech TV, where we are your fierce advocates for construction.